motion. So we've already seen some introduction to springs. We're going to talk about them in a little bit more detail. And I want to show you that springs are, in a sense, everywhere, and it's a way that physicists think about a lot of things in the world. But before I do that, this is the first question that I wanted to ask. So I gave you that announcement, and I told you to watch that video. What was your opinion of the tutorial video which solved this strict bicep curl problem? I see a lot of cringy faces, but there's answers for those people too. Uh, it was less helpful than what was presented in the lecture. It was more helpful. I didn't watch it, but I bet it was pretty good. And I didn't watch it, but I'm sure I will before next lecture. So go ahead and choose which one. I don't care which one. Honesty is the best policy. And there is no none of the above. So honesty and guilt will put us where we should be for next time. So take about 10 more seconds. This is opinions. You can't get it wrong. Okay. Five, four, three, two, and one. Okay. Just what I expected. 36% of you said D. You really plan on watching it before next lecture, so that's good. I'll ask again next time. But I do want you to, to take a look at it. 30% of you said you bet it was pretty good. So I'll take that as a compliment, uh, even though it means you didn't actually look at it. So anyway, that gives you a, one little bit of homework that's very easy. I expected the answer that I got, so that's fine. Now we're going to move on to springs and something called Hooke's Law. This should actually be a pretty easy topic at this point, because we've dealt with Newton's laws enough that this should be OK. But I want to look at biological examples. So I know a lot of you are much more interested in biology than in physics. So I want to look at real biology systems and how there are examples. The one that we'll talk about today is something called the human femur. Does anybody in here have a femur? Yes, OK. Bone is an incredibly complex and interesting material, actually. So from any standpoint, engineering, physics, bone is actually a remarkable material. So if you were to cut open and cross-section your bone, you would find that it's not just this kind of hard, kind of skeleton mineral like we think of fossils. The bone is actually made up of all sorts of different things. It has a, a hard outer part. This is kind of the, the brittle part of the bone. There's a, a softer, what they call the spongy bone or the internal bone. And then there's this stuff where there's this very compact bone that basically forms these threads of support within your actual inside of the bone. Okay? And what we're going to talk about is that our bones, like the femur, are actually very much like springs. They're not completely rigid materials. They actually can be compressed and extended. Is anybody familiar with osteoporosis? What is osteoporosis? What actually happens in osteoporosis? So one thing that happens in osteoporosis is that your bone density becomes reduced. Your bones become more porous. Okay? The other thing, why do we have hip breakages in elderly that often cause fatality? Why does it happen? It's because the bone itself becomes brittle. Okay? So osteoporosis is a disease, a disease in which this, all of this bone, much of this bone, becomes hollow. It starts to become porous. And when that happens, our bone is no longer a good spring. It becomes very brittle, and it can crack very easily. And in the elderly, it's often fatal. So if any of you are going to go into uh, elder medicine, you'll find that this is one of the top fatalities uh, from impacts the broken hips. Okay? So we're going to talk about bone and how the springiness of bone is actually what makes us quite survivable. Right? Springiness in bones is important for us. I wanted to challenge you before we get into that, though, with a question from the topics we talked about the last two lectures. Okay? Shh, try this. Okay? Sit down. Remember we talked about. Here are two things we talked about. We talked about torque, and we talked about moment of inertia. You remember this expression? Let me write it down. I think we've worked with this enough. Does this expression look familiar? So the torque on an object is the moment of inertia, 
which was the sum of mass times the radius squared times the angular acceleration. So this was Newton's second law written for rotational coordinates. So take a minute and see if you can answer this question using this basic idea. Which object will win this race? If I roll two equal diameter objects of the same mass down a ramp, which one will actually accelerate faster to win this race? Okay. So see if you can use your thinking caps to try to answer this with some kind of educated gas. We know that torque is equal to I alpha, and we know a few things about this thing moment of position. second and ask you something really quickly. Okay, wait. I have another question that's going to come back to us next week. And I want to make sure that we can relate it to this. I have two little dumbbells. Yeah, dumbbell. Tell me where my moment of inertia is bigger. Okay? Is my moment of inertia larger when these dumbbells are out here or when the dumbbells are close? Out, right? So the moment of inertia is mass times the distance from the pivot squared, okay? So let me do a thought experiment. We'll talk a lot about this next time. If I were spinning, right? Imagine I was spinning because some torque had been applied to me. Would I accelerate more if I had them out here or if I had them in here for a fixed torque? It becomes a little harder, okay? What we said, and you can see it here, we'll come back to that question specifically. If I'm given a torque, and I ask how I'm going to accelerate, that acceleration, I can rewrite this equation. As the torque divided by the moment of inertia, okay? So if my moment of inertia is big out here, will I have a large acceleration or small? Big moment of inertia is small angular acceleration. Have you ever ridden one of these rides in a playground where you, there's a little pole with a handle and you spin and spin and spin and then you pull yourself to the pole and spin really fast? Have you ever watched figure skate where figure skaters, they swing their arms around out in a big circle and then they pull everything in and start spinning really fast? This is the phenomenon. We're gonna talk about this thing called angular momentum next week. This is basically how we're going to understand angular momentum is through this moment of inertia. So coming back to this question, which object win, wins the race? Which of these objects has a larger moment of inertia? Which one has larger moment of inertia? The hoop or the cylinder? I heard hoop. It almost sounded like everyone was like barking at me for a second. The hoop has a larger moment of inertia. Objects with larger moment of inertia should accelerate less easily with a given torque. We can try it. So we have two exact same masses. One is a solid piece of wood with some masses added to it to match. The other one's just a metal ring. We said that the hoop should win or lose? lose. Hoop should lose. Okay, good. Let's see. Okay. I think you saw which one won. When you have mass that's concentrated towards the axis of rotation, you're going to have a much larger acceleration for a given torque. Okay? In this ex example of the, the ice skater, right? So when these ice skaters basically come into these axle movements, they're using the mass of their arms and legs at a large distance from the center. They pull them in and they start spinning much, much faster. They gain angular acceleration. And we're going to solve that and understand it really kind of in detail next time. But I just wanted to see that you could review this, and actually 92% of you, that's probably the best response I've had the entire quarter. 92% of you got it exactly right, that the hoop loses, the cylinder wins. Great.
So now we're going to talk about something. Uh, this is what we just said. I had a smaller moment of inertia. Now we're going to talk about a very brief topic that we've already solved some problems with. It's related to moment of inertia, and this is balance. Okay. So when we want to understand balance, we have to understand torque and moment of inertia. So here's a picture. This is a very famous person, actually, in the Yoda world. Uh, but for an object to balance, its center of gravity must be over some base of support. That way, gravity doesn't exert a torque. Okay? So if you look at this picture, there's the center of mass of this person doing yoga. The base of support is the hands, these set of hands. What would happen if that center of mass was off to the right a little bit from the hands? The person would tip forward. Do you see that, that would be, that's because I'm at a very special point right above my hands where I have no torque applied to this object. Gravity, the, the, the force due to gravity is pulling down along that line, and there's no torque. When that, that position moves slightly toward the right, I then have a component of gravity that will pull me to the ground. So let me see what this looks like. Gravity provides essentially acts at the center of mass, but it provides no torque when it's perfectly balanced. So the definition of an object in equilibrium and balancing is that the gravitational force provides no torque on the system. And we can think about this going back to driving. Remember I told you this story of driving on the road and this guy in a Halloween mask looked at me and tried to scare me or whatever, but then I went around the turn and he did not. Uh, this is a very real risk that that driver was, was going through. Okay, I wasn't, I was completely fine. But imagine you're racing down the highway. This is, say, coming at the street, you're driving out of the board. You have a base of support. Here's a question for the gearhead. When I think about sports cars, race cars, do they have a narrower wheelbase or a wider wheelbase from side to side? Much, much wider. Okay? The wider that wheelbase, the easier it is to keep your center of mass between those two points of contact. And here's the reason it's important, is that if I were to start tipping, okay, this is terrifying, but it could happen. Does anybody own a Jeep or a RAV4? I hope nobody, do you own a RAV4 for real? Okay, these are notoriously dangerous cars for going around turns. Jeeps aren't as bad as they used to be, but RAV4s are notoriously bad, like court case bad, okay? <laughs> You should look at the history. Okay? This is something that can very much happen. If you're going very fast and you start to turn and you, you don't have a wide wheelbase, look what's happening here. If I come up onto one wheel, my pivot is this point on the right, and the torque here is trying to rotate the car in which direction? In this picture. Basically, you're taking it counterclockwise. It's a positive torque. So if you're lucky and you only tilt this much, Things are okay. Gravity will pull you back down to the floor. There's a critical point at which you could be balanced. Has anyone ever seen stunt drivers do this? They have a little ramp on one side and then they drive exactly at the balance point. You can, in principle, balance for quite a long period of time as long as there's no torque acting in the center of mass. So in this case, you see the force of gravity is acting down in the center of mass, it's right over the wheelbase, and so you're okay. The scary part is when your torque wants to drag you over to the other side. Okay? So let me just draw a really simple schematic of what you, how you would address this in a problem. Is I can draw the pivot, which is that tire. I can draw the center of mass, and it has some weight. Okay? Do you see that if I draw that diagram, I have a pivot point. Which direction would that force cause this mass to rotate in the diagram that I've drawn? Clockwise. Clockwise. Okay. It's the component of the weight perpendicular to the radial vector. So it's something that looks like this. This is weight perpendicular, I call it. The magnitude of that force is what causes rotation. Remember, it's r times force perpendicular. So balance is effectively defined as when the point of the center of mass is above some point of support in the system, and there is no ability to have a gravitational torque applied. In either of these other cases, I'm out of balance, right? This one will pull my car back down to the ground. 
this one will hold my car to the ground on its side. Okay? So when we use the word balance, what we mean is that there is no gravitational torque acting on the object. And coming back to this last picture, we all said this, that there's this thing called the line of action, which is basically the same as in your torque problems. And if that center of mass comes forward of the base of support, this person does a face plant. Okay? So this is just like the car. I can draw a line from the pivot point, the wrists, up to the center of mass, and the diagram looks exactly like what I do before. And I have a torque that rotates me in the negative direction of clock. So any questions about that? I'm going to move on to springs now. This is basically the last piece of the torque problem that we'll see. But when we come back to angular momentum and momentum next week, we'll see some of these ideas come back a little bit more. So let's move on to springs to understand a few things about springs. Everybody in here knows what a spring is, I'm sure. I will assume, but I'm sure. This is a, this is a typical spring, right? This is a very hard spring. It's a, it's a very rigid spring. Who, on your car, does anybody know what a leaf spring is on your car? What are a leaf springs? What do they look like? Do they look like this? Not at all, okay? On your car, you have these little pieces of metal that are cut into sheets, thin sheets like this, they're banded together, and they're allowed to bend. These are springs that are more like this ruler. This ruler, from a physical standpoint, is a spring. When I try to bend it, there's a force that wants it to go back to straight. Okay? So we're going to define springs really carefully. It's not just this. This is a good model for springs, but there are many other versions of springs, like these springs, like the forces between atoms, like this drum head. Right? If I take and I hit this drum head, there's a force that brings it back to normal, right? So I displace it, and it comes back to normal. The other thing about springs is that I can stretch them, right? So I can pull this spring, and it pulls back to normal. But I can also compress it, and it pushes back to normal. So springs are a bit harder to solve because there's always a force acting to bring it back to normal. And that force in some axis can either be positive or negative, as we'll see. So everybody knows what a spring is, but we're going to explore lots of different versions of that. So springs, in general, are an example of systems that we will call elastic. There are many different elastic systems that we'll talk about. And elastic systems have, by definition, a restoring force that brings the system back to its equilibrium position. So let me show you a type of thing that I think about all the time, which is crystals. Right? Here's a little model of atoms connected into a cubic lattice. So like salt, sodium chloride crystals have this structure. The way we think about them in solid state physics is that it's just a whole bunch of masses connected by springs. I can twist, I can squeeze, I can, I can distort in all different directions, but these springs bring the crystal back into its regular position or equilibrium position. So again, atoms and the things at very small scales act like springs just like any other spring that we think about. Uh, if you compress a spring, okay, and we'll use this as definition, compress means to essentially shorten the spring, there is a force that tries to bring the spring back to its original length, right? Anyone that's ever squeezed, for instance, a basketball, pick a basketball in your hands and try to compress a basketball, there's a force pushing back on your hands that wants the basketball to be back in its original equilibrium position. A basketball is yet another elastic system that you can model as a spring. So in addition to compression, you can also stretch spring. And this, I think, is more kind of understood. People get this part. So you can stretch a spring. But if I do that, if I try to pull one end of this spring from the other, there's now a force it's trying to pull it, again, back to its normal length. And it wants to go back to what its original length is, which we call equilibrium. So springs are pretty easy to intuit, but when we start solving problems, we have to be a little more careful. So in most cases, you can think of springs like this. There are long linear things. They're usually like the shape of a slinky. Are you familiar with slinkies? Maybe that's too, too ancient history for you. But slinkies are basically very soft springs. 
And slinkies can actually walk downstairs because they both compress and extend with the kind of bouncing force that drives you downstairs. There are also little springs. If you rip open an old clock or an old pocket watch, you would see springs that are coils of metal. If I twist this coil, it restores back to normal. There's a force associated with that, and it behaves in a sense just like what we're going to talk about. But there are also some really cool examples in biology. These are the examples that I am actually more interested in. I have a colleague when I was at MIT, she was at Harvard. She's now at Harvey Mudd, which is close to here. She actually studied this funny little piece of physics in peas. So in peas, they have these, who's ever grown peas in your garden? Peas have these little thing called pea shoots. And what they do is they reach out these little feelers, they look like little branches, and they actually wrap around other things so that the peas grow onto those things. So when you grow peas, normally what you do is you take a piece of wood and then you take strings across and the peas actually grab the strings and create little springs to hold them there. Okay? So these things are remarkably well behaved. They behave just like the metal springs that we see here. And my friend, who was, again was at Harvard at the time she did this, she wanted to understand why plants would have springs. Why would you want a spring? And it turns out that springs are very good for dealing with things that are always changing, right? If I'm moving, if there's wind, those springs will kind of allow you to come back to equilibrium. The other example that we'll talk about today is bone. And many other examples in the human body, but bone is one that's often surprising. We think of bone as a rigid object, but in fact it's a spring. Okay? It can be thought of as a spring. And then there are some other conventional ones. Here's a picture of the leaf springs. If you look under your car, almost all of your cars have not big shock absorber strings. Springs, they're usually leaf springs. And all they are are these little metal bands, and they can flex and be compressed, but they go back to normal. This is why when you drive on the highway, you don't feel every single bump, especially on what? Route 60, it's awful. And right? if you drive from here to the, to the sea, it's the worst road that I've ever driven. And then, does anybody know what this is? This is a prosthetic leg for athletics, right? This is essentially a prosthetic limb for running. And it's amazing that the, the technology that's been developed here, this is actually a, a couple of years old now, they've gotten even better. What they've been able to do with these prosthetics is basically tune this little piece of metal to have a spring constant that mimics the spring constant of your lower bones and ankle joint, okay? So there are now basically athletes who can outrun me for sure that use prosthetic limbs that are tuned to match the spring constant of your leg. So biomedical engineers have said, let's study the legs, let's extract the behavior that looks like a spring, and let's mimic that to basically recreate a running limb. Okay? So all of these applications are based on the physics we'll talk about today. It's actually quite simple physics, and it happens in all sorts of places that many of you will continue working with after you've left this course. So how do they work? Okay. We can kind of, before we look at that picture, there's a way to stare at it first and see. All I have here, this is a really simple spring. Okay. And just like I said, if you see it right now, it's sitting at an equilibrium position. Right? It's some distance, gravity's pulling on it, it's kind of stuck there. If I compress it, so if I push it up, when I let it go, it, gravity will basically pull it back down to its equilibrium position. So when we say equilibrium position in a spring, it often includes, for hanging springs, the fact that the spring has mass and gravity pulling on it. Okay? But I can play a little game. So here's 100 grams. I can bring this thing to stillness. Right now, the bottom of this spring is at 25 centimeters on this wall. The zero is where it connects. It's at 25 centimeters down. I can basically take this, again, 100 grams, and I can ask how far did it displace. So it went from 25, now it's down to about 35 centimeters. Okay. Is this system in equilibrium or not? Why not? It's wiggling a little bit. Ignore the wiggles. Is it in equilibrium or not? What do we say about equilibrium? The accelerations on the system have to be zero. Is this system accelerating? No. Okay. So springs, they have an equilibrium position without any mass. When I apply a mass to them, 
they are now again in equilibrium. Okay? I can add another mass to it. This is, this is 200, so let's just add it to it to get 300. I can now displace it again. If I hold it still, is it accelerating? No. I now have found another equilibrium in this spring. So springs have this weird ability to basically respond to the force that's applied by changing their length. And so our, we know that anything that we write down will have to reflect that. So here's exactly what I've drawn. I have a, a relaxed spring, has some initial length. I apply a mass to it, it pulls it down. And then all we're gonna do is apply Newton's laws. I can apply Newton's second law to see that this block of mass M, which has a weight, there's an equal and opposite force due to the spring that's pulling it back into equilibrium. Okay, do you see that that's exactly what we did here? We added more mass, we changed the weight, and we therefore have to change the spring force. If I take this mass away, I have a different mass, a different weight, and so the spring force has to change. So every time we add mass to a, a, a hanging spring, we're changing that force, and in all of those cases, the spring force is equal to the weight. Right? So if I add more weight, the spring force gets bigger. If I add less weight, the spring force gets smaller. And here's what you might get. If I were to plot a whole bunch of different weights, let's say I took a bunch of different masses so that I had a whole bunch of different weights, and I measured how much the spring stretches, I would get a linear relationship between force and distance. Okay? And you can kind of see that here. If I have 100, it's at some value, 35. If I add 200 to it, I get another stretch. It's now at something like 75. So basically these distances, if I were to measure a whole bunch of distances and the forces equivalent to these weights, I would get a slope that is a straight line. Okay? And this is how we're going to say this. The spring force is equal to the change in length times some constant, which defines how stiff or soft that spring is. So K is the spring constant, and it describes how strong the spring really is. So this is something called Hooke's Law. And this is some one more piece that we can add to all of the other pieces that we've done. Let me show you one other thing that we won't deal with in this course, but you can imagine a little bit. What happens if I am holding this mass down and I let go of this, this spring? What's the mass going to do? It's going to go up and then come down. Okay? It's going to oscillate. So springs, when you start going into physics 2B and you start talking about oscillations, you're going to see a lot of springs because these are natural ways of thinking about oscillations. When I pull the spring, there's a force that wants to pull it up. When I start to push the spring, there's a force that wants to push it down. So the sign of that force is changing back and forth as the mass goes up and down. And so Hooke's law is what basically captures this. Here's a, a picture again. Here's an unstretched spring. That's the equilibrium spring. I then pull the spring to a stretch position, and I have a change in position that's positive. So we're calling the right positive. And I know that what's the force that's going to pull? In the second case, what's the restoring force going to do? It wants to pull it left. So if I have a positive displacement, the restoring force is negative. If I have a negative displacement, the spring wants to push positive. Yeah. Oh yeah, we'll talk about that. That'll come at the very end. Yeah. So there's something called elasticity, and then there's something called plasticity. And we'll talk about that at the very end. So when something goes too far, it becomes plastic. Okay? So we know this. Now we can start to write down our physical law. That x sub e, we can call that the equilibrium position. That's where the spring started. Uh, and then I change it by a length that, remember, when we write delta x, it's x final minus x initial. The initial length was x sub e, the final length is x. And so in this stretched case, that's a positive number. In the compressed case, it's a negative number. So the sign of delta x matters. If it's stretched, we said that delta x is positive, but the force is negative. If it's compressed, delta x is negative and force is positive. So in a spring, the way to remember this is that the restoring force is always opposite the displacement that I put on the spring. 
If I take, I can try this with a softer spring. If I pull this, this is to your positive direction in the x direction. If I pull this spring this way, the force is always opposite that. If I compress the spring this way, the force is always opposite that. So the way we remember this in springs is that the force is effectively always opposite the displacement of the spring, whether compression or not. And the way you write that down is that the spring force, this is Hoke's law, is proportional directly to the distance, how far I stretched it, and some constant that tells us whether it's a hard or a soft spring, but there's a minus sign there because it's always in the opposite direction, okay? So this is basically how we think of everything in physics. We start with springs. When you go into the later physics courses, you'll learn that this is called the harmonic approximation, and you'll study oscillating systems this way, okay? When I look at a graph, I could give you a graph like this in a homework, you'll see stuff like this, or maybe even on the exam, is that if I plot the spring force as a function of that displacement, it's a negative slope. So I'd always be able to extract the spring constant from the amount of force that I need to displace the spring some distance x, okay? So remember, the easiest way to remember is that the force, the spring force is always opposite the direction of your displacement. So here's an example, really simple example. We'll just go through pretty quickly. So a 20, a 20 centimeter long spring is attached to a wall, so you have it fixed on one point, and it stretches to some new distance, 22 centimeters. Okay. When it is pulled horizontally with a force of 100 newtons, how do we find the spring constant? Okay. The way to do this is actually quite simple. We have Hooke's law. When it stops stretching, we know that the force that the spring exerts is equal to the applied force. If I have a, a system where I'm pulling on this side with 100 newtons, and then I'm in equilibrium, it means that the spring is holding back 100 newtons. If I pull this harder with 150 newtons, how, many, how much force is the spring pulling back? 150 newtons. And I can keep saying that as long as I am in the elastic limit and I'm not plastic, I basically would increase. The force that the spring applies to me increases, just like we saw in static friction. Do you remember in static friction, if I push an object with 10 newtons, the object pushes me back. If I push 20 newtons and it still doesn't move, it's pushing me back with 20 newtons. It's the same with the spring force. When I extend, the force is always basically changing to adapt that force. So if I calculate this, the spring force we know is negative 100 newtons because of the direction that I've chosen here. And I have a displacement of 22 centimeters minus 20, the equilibrium, so it's changing by about 2 centimeters. And that allows me to solve for a spring constant of 5,000 newtons per meter. Okay? So it's just a number. It tells you how rigid the spring is to resistance. For, for a ballpark, if you think about DNA, so DNA is also a spring. Let me go get a quick model of DNA. Give me a second. What does DNA look like? Do we know? It's a double helix, okay? But DNA has a weird property. It's about a nanometer in diameter, and it's extremely long. Here's a string model of a string of DNA, right? It's basically a very long string that is acting like a spring. If I stretch DNA, if I compress DNA, just like this string, DNA is acting with the Hooke's law. It turns out you can solve, and I have a colleague who does this, she, she wanted to solve what is the spring constant of DNA. If I take DNA and I pull on it, how hard does it pull back? It turns out it's a very soft spring of about one newton per meter. This 5,000 newton meters is kind of like a typical spring. If you pick up kind of a rigid spring, you might get something like that, okay? DNA is a very floppy kind of soft spring, but it still behaves like a spring. And the way she did this was kind of ingenious. She basically takes a laser to pull on one side and then fixes it to a, a cell on the other side and just starts yanking on the DNA and then letting it go, okay? 
And in doing that, she did exactly the experiment we just said. We're basically displacing, asking how are the forces that's pulling back, and you can actually measure DNA as a spring. Now, when we talk about materials, we have a slightly different set of equations, and I'm just going to go through them pretty quickly so that we can understand bone. There's a thing called, and don't get too wrapped up in this, you'll maybe have one problem on it, it's very simple. It's called Young's modulus. So if I take, instead of a, a physical spring, if I take a physical object that I'm modeling as a spring, like a bridge, for instance, I would say that in that rod, say there's a big piece of metal strapped to the wall, it has a compression force. If I push and try to squeeze this object, just like a spring, it wants to go back to equilibrium. And we just characterize it differently because we, we talk about it as a fault material. But the force exerted by a stretched or compressed material or rod is exactly the same as Pope's law. So we would have a restoring force equal to this thing called the Young's modulus. I'll explain it in a second. The area, the cross-sectional area of this, of this spring, divided by the length. And then you see there's a change in length, just like we saw in the spring. If I compress it, there's a change in length. If I pull it, it's going to have a change in length. Okay? So this is basically the materials version of that. Let me show you one thing really quickly. Let me get it pulled up here. You may have seen this before, but I'll show it to you anyway. This is a very famous example of a bridge that was behaving like a spring. Has anyone ever heard of the Tacoma Narrows bridge collapse? OK, watch this. This is a presumably solid bridge that cars drive over on a regular basis. And this is what happens when in this valley that this bridge was crossing basically was heavy windstorm. This bridge basically was an oscillator, perfect, there's a car, real life car, on the bridge. This is cement, like the bridges that you drive over every day. This is a heavy cement, metal reinforced bridge. And it was called, I think they called it like the Whistling Gertie or something. Because when this bridge, does anybody play wind instruments? How does a woodwind instrument work? You basically blow air across this thing called a reed which is a solid material, and it does exactly what this bridge is doing. Only the, the frequencies of it in a, in a flute, or not a flute, but a clarinet, is basically enough that it's a high pitch that you can hear. Okay. This is a spring. This is a, something that looks solid. It's made of metal. It's made of cement. And it's behaving more like, I don't know, a piece of plastic or rubber, right? So now when we go back to understand this, we just have a slightly different model, and this is called the Young's modulus. Otherwise, it's essentially the same physics. If I squeeze or compress that bridge, there's a restoring force that wants to bring it back to equilibrium. And this thing, Y, is called the Young's modulus, which depends on the material that the rod's made of. There's a list of them in your text. I'm not going to go over it too much. And this Young's modulus times the cross-sectional area divided by the length is just the spring constant. So we can now go back to this problem of your bones by using this model. So this equation gives us the restoring force when we change the length. If we rearrange the terms and make everything positive, we basically get this thing called the stress-strain relationship. If you go into engineering, which many of you probably want, unless it's bioengineering, you'll hear a lot about this thing called the stress-strain relationship. The idea is if I yank on a piece of material and change its length, how much stress does that material undergo? Right? But this is basically a hook saw. There's a restoring force called the stress. There's a change in length of the original length, which is like Hooke's law. And there's this thing called Young's modulus. So who's ever had a bone density scan? Anybody? Yeah, some people have. So if you have a bone density scan, they're effectively measuring this relationship. They are basically driving an oscillator in your bone. They're looking at how the bone responds to that oscillator. When you change some length on a really small scale, how does the bone restore the force? So when you're getting a bone density scan, they're basically measuring your bone the same way they would measure a building or a piece of metal. They're using the, the Young's modulus. And this finally gets us to this question of how springy is the human femur. 
Okay? So let me just work through this problem. It's actually a pretty simple problem. Uh, and the answer is actually maybe not too surprising, but I'll leave it up on one side. And I'll get back to this plasticity problem at the very end. But how springy is the femur? If you support your entire weight on one leg, I think I can do it. Let me try it. Doing this, this is what the problem task is. Support my weight on one leg. By what fraction of the initial length did my leg just shorten? Right? It's a spring, so there's a force, the weight. It's compressing this femur, and you can ask about how much does it compress. So if you solve this problem, you just need a few pieces of information. But the typical human is about 70 kilograms. That gives us our mass, so we can get our weight from that. And the stress on the femur is the force per unit area. There's a cross-section there. Your femur is about an inch in diameter or so. A little narrower, but a little wider in certain parts, but about an inch. And the weight is just mg, right? So that's just the weight of my, my typical human body. And if I use this equation, I can just solve it just like we solved with a solid metal rod. The force per unit area is the Young's modulus times the change in length that my bone gets compressed. So if I look at the change in length, I just rearrange. It's 1 over the Young's modulus, which is a number. The mass is 70 kilograms, g is 9.8 meters per second, and a is about an inch. So you can ask exactly how much does my bone compress? So in humans, if I write this in terms of meters, the cross section is about 5 times 10 to the minus 4 meters. It's basically converting the area corresponding to an inch to meters squared. And the Young's modulus is actually well measured, oddly enough. In fact, a lot of these numbers were measured a long, long time ago. People used to take cadavers and put them in mechanical machines to measure the properties of the human body, mostly the skeleton. Young's modulus of cortical bone, the bone that makes up the kind of the strong part of your, or, of your femur, is a number 1.6 times 10 to the 10 newtons per meter squared. And if you just plug all these numbers in, you get that your bone changes length by about one tenth of a percent, one one hundredth of a percent. So when I stand, my bone is compressing only a tiny, tiny bit, about one one hundredth of a percent. If my bone didn't compress even that little bit, I would be at risk for my hip being broken. So the difference in this displacement between a healthy bone and someone with bad, bad, kind of severe osteoporosis is basically whether it modifies its length by one one hundred percent. Yeah? That's right. It's, it's basically you have to measure it. Either way. Yeah, it might actually be calculated, but it might say, here's a piece of bridge. Now, getting back to that other question that you asked earlier, this is the last bit before we go. What happens if I take a spring and I stretch it too far? Okay? I think the demo people will be mad if I did it, so I won't do it. But imagine what would happen. If I take this spring, I take it a certain distance, there's a restoring force. And if I plot that, that restoring force, let me put this on all three, I would get a linear relationship between the force and the distance, right? Here's the force, here's the distance. At some point, something bad happens. 